We're greatly honored to have the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons take over this program. We have nothing to do with it. It's their program, and it's going to be magnificent. I hope you stay because you'll get some very vital, vital information, and I understand they're going to tell you really what you can do about it. Now, it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Dorothy from Mississippi, Memphis, Tennessee. I should know I haven't been down there. Uh, and he is the president of the American Association. So he will give you his credentials and he'll carry on from here. Dr. Dorothy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We, members of the Association of Medical Physicians and Surgeons, know that the attacks on medicine are just one of the facets of our lives and of our economy under attack. We are being bombarded and attacked from every angle, every source. Medicine is just one, and I don't want anybody to forget that, but if we are to preserve any of our freedom that we have left, we have to oppose any and all encroachments whenever and wherever they arise. The attacks on medicine is an encroachment, and we intend to hold the forward and attack at every chance, every opportunity, that we have. The program that we have outlined for you today is kind of like serving your dessert first. When I was a child, if I didn't eat my spinach, I couldn't get the tater pie. But Dr. Sheikin has some other plans, uh, some other commitments, so we had to put him on first, and we're going to give you your dessert on the front end. Dr. Rudy Schenken is professor of pathology at the University of Nebraska. He was chairman at the, of the Department of Pathology at LSU, Tulane, for a total of about 13, 15 years. He is well associated and well knowledgeable in the field of academia. It is paradoxical that you would find a man of his knowledge and his ability who has been a professor and still retains his ideas about the free enterprise system, the capitalistic system, and the freedoms that are under attack, as if you would expect and see in the practice of private medicine under the free enterprise system. He's past president of the American Association of Blood Banks, American Society of Clinical Pathologists, American Board of Pathologists, National Examination Board, President of the International Congress of Clinical Pathologists. He's been very active in organized medicine. He is one of our most esteemed, knowledgeable, well men in the field, uh, doctors in general and doctors specifically. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Rudy Schinken. Dr. Doherty and friends who are here today dedicated is a force to try to thwart those that would deny God, deny the family, and deny the country. And I hope that my contribution today will in some way help as a deterrent to these uh, forces, which I think we can easily identify as the forces of socialism. I think it is only fitting that we're here in a geographic location where the cradles of religious freedom, political freedom, resistance to tyranny, and the dem demonstrated failure of socialism in the original Plymouth colony were all enacted here in the vicinity of Boston. 
Jesus, which is going to be my subject today, the life of Christ, left us an indelible blueprint to fight for and retain all of our freedoms. If only we could recognize that the force of secularism under the guise of humanistic influences are now eroding these freedoms. In his time, Jesus lived in a world that was basically no different than ours from the standpoint of the problems. There was war, there was enslavement, that there was, there was conquest, there was subjugation, there was uh, adultery, there was corruption, there was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, there was the graft of the Sadducees in the temple, there was the political expediency of Pontius Pilate, there was cowardice of the disciples, the dishonesty of Peter, the sadistic hatred of the mob, when they yelled, crucify him, the indifference of the populace, and the brutality of the Roman soldiers, and the deceit of the priests and the scribes. All of these things are still with us today, but God forbid how bad they would have been without his word having been brought to the world. I suppose by now you're wondering how I, as a physician, became interested, at this level at least, in the life of Christ. I was looking for artists' depictions of disease in museums and art books when I certainly, suddenly had my interest in the Bible and his word rekindled as a result of the various ideas that artists had as to how to illustrate events, particularly those which occurred in the New Testament. We must remember in revealing the life of Christ that he was a duality on earth. He was the Son of Man conceived through spiritual intervention and was born of Mary. And he was the son of God because he was sent here by him with a message of love, repentance, forgiveness of sins, and salvation, all of which were foreign to the then existing beliefs. And Christianity, therefore, really was based on the foundation of Judaism and built on the principles of the Judaic concept. So we now today call this the Judeo-Christian ethic. I think sometimes we have made a mistake when we wrote the word Judeo-Christian ethic as a hyphenated word, as if there were two segments of it. It would have been much better had it been one word, because it was a normal evolutionary process that Christianity was built on Judaic beliefs and particularly the Ten Commandments. Also in revealing the life of Christ, I want you to remember his two names, Jesus and Christ. Jesus in Greek, Jesus in Hebrew, meant the Savior. And the Hebrews were looking for the earthly Savior. So they were looking for Jesus, another David. The Christ, however, in the Greek was Christos. In the Hebrew was the Messiah. And this is what we have accepted him as the Messiah. This only points up the duality of his life and explains much 
of his uh, behavior. I think it also will go far for us to better understand what Judas Iscariot really tried to do. Was he truly a betrayer? Or was he a true zealot that tried to transform Christ into the Savior that the Jews were looking for, to liberate them from Roman oppression? And with this th brief introduction as a background, we'll go through some of the highlights as depicted by the great artists of the world, illustrating the life of Christ. The first slide. This is a uh, photograph of a, the Annunciation by Paoli, which is in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And here is the angel Gabriel announcing to Mary that she will be bearing a child that he must, she must name him Jesus. The artist, however, in order to emphasize the purity of this scene, on the left side illust illustrated Adam of Eve being dispelled from the garden. Here is the angel at the direction of God because of their disobedience. On the right side, it shows Joseph, who was deeply worried because at this time, Joseph and Mary were only betrothed. Next slide. Here is another illustration of the same thing by a master of the Redible. This is in the Young Museum in San Francisco. Uh, I show it to you only because it's somewhat amusing. Uh, notice the golden beams coming down from the heavens above, striking Mary. And right here, next slide, you, you'll see on this golden beam the picture of a tiny a baby. Next slide. And then Joseph, being worried and deeply disturbed, fell asleep and had a dream. And the angel told Joseph, the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you need worry no more about her being an adulteress. And here is a uh, painting by Champagne in the National Gallery in London with Joseph asleep. Mary here, apprehensive, and the angel announcing uh, the conception to Joseph. Next slide. And this is an important scene, the visitation by Albertinelli, which is in Florence, because uh, here is Elizabeth, her cousin, who was an old lady at this time and who had always been a baron. And Mary came to her and announced to her that she would be with child, and at that moment, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth spoke and said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child you will bear. Uh, you're familiar with this because it's part of the liturgy of many of our, our religious ceremonies. Next slide. And then the birth of Christ. Augustus Caesar decreed that all citizens were required to register at their ancestors' birth. So Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem. This is a painting by Baraki in the Prado Museum in Madrid. It shows Mary here adoring her little child. Actually, it's one of the few paintings that I've ever seen where this conceivably could be a cave because it is quite 
likely that this was not some broken down palace, some barn, or something like that, which is the usual way of illustrating this scene. But it was a cave, and these caves are still in existence in uh, Bethlehem. And of course, the sweetness of her face, the darling appearance of the child, the presence of the donkey and the oxen, of course, are common symbols of the scene of nativity. Next slide. And here is the adoration of this shepherd. Here is Mary showing these shepherds, indicated by uh, the presence of the sheep, uh, adoring this newborn child. They were told by the angel that today in the town of David a Savior has been born. I think the importance of this is that it demonstrated that the humble and the poor and the illiterate paid homage to him. Next slide. At this particular meeting also, in the Bible, there is a statement uh, that there will be peace on earth, goodwill to men. I think the better translation is that there is going to be peace on earth to men of goodwill. This is the scene of the circumcision. There aren't many of these paintings in the world. Christ was circumcised. Here he is, being circumcised by the priest, being watched by, uh, the, uh, by Joseph here and Mary here, who's brought her little sacrifice with her, two pigeons. Uh, and I emphasize it only because this emphasizes that Christ was born and reared in a strictly uh, Jewish uh, family because they adhered to the principles existed at that time and to this day that circumcision as the mark of the Jew uh, should be carried out on the eighth day. Next. And here is the presentation in the temple uh, to uh, Simeon, the priest, Anna, the priestess who had lived in the temple all of her life, and in the background you can see Joseph and Mary. And here is another instance in which they carried the two little pigeons which were commonly uh, used as indication of sacrifice when some religious ceremony was carried out. This was 40 days after birth. It was the act of purification. Next. After this, there came the adoration of the Magi, the wise men. Many artists place this in a scene similar to the scene of the birth with the oxen and the uh, a donkey, etc., in a stable. This is not accurate. They moved out of the scene of his birth into a house. And although he was smaller than this, uh, here are the uh, wise men that appeared to pay homage with their frank incense, their myrrh, and their gold. I think this is a demonstration that the rich, that the mathematicians, the physicians, the intellectuals, the powerful, were also paying homage uh, to Jesus, just as the illiterate shepherds had done. Next line. I think it's a beautiful painting by Raphael in the Munich Museum, and it shows, here's Mary, here's Elizabeth, you can see that she's much older, and here is John the Baptist, born of Elizabeth, and the Christ child with Joseph in the background. I only show you this to emphasize that John the Baptist and the Christ child were born about the same time, and that he came on earth to pave the way so that the ministry of Jesus later could be carried out. Next slide. But when the wise men, by the way, did not return to Herod, after they had consulted with Herod 
and asked him, where is this king of the Jews of which we have heard? And they decided that Herod could not be trusted, so they went uh, back another way. So Herod, in order to destroy any rival, had all children under two years of age destroyed. And so here is a scene by Giotto, which is in Assisi, Italy, showing Herod here supervising the scene. Here's a child being run through by a sword. Here are the dead babies here as a result of this slaughter. But at the same time, Joseph had a dream. Next slide. And he was told to take his wife and his child and flee to Egypt. This is a painting by Fabriano, also an Apisi in Italy, and it shows Joseph here leading the donkey with Mary and the child aboard the donkey. Next slide. I took this picture in a church in Sweden. I thought it was so sweet that I wanted to share it with you also because it's a stained glass window in a relatively modern uh, church uh, compared with some of the European churches. And here is the Christ child, and here's the donkey. Here's Joseph uh, with the, on the flight to Egypt. Next slide. Uh, another picture of John the Baptist and the Christ child here, John the Baptist here. And I show this only to show you that the artists often show John the Baptist with his camel's hair clothing, either when he's a small child or when he's grown up. They also often show him with a long staff in the form of a cross. This is the symbol of John the Baptist because he is instructed according to Luke, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. He lived in the desert most of the time before he started his ministry to prepare the way. Next slide. Then there is a long, uh, uh, I, uh, a long uh, time between uh, his birth and when he's 12 years of age, about which we know practically nothing. And one day, when his family had prayed at the temple and were on the way back uh, to their home at that time in Bethany, he escaped and went back to the temple and astonished those in the temple with his learning. And when they discovered that he was gone, next slide, this is a beautiful painting by Murillo. Uh, his mother, with an expression of astonishment on her face, as if she's saying, where have you been? And he answered, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? No, Mary could not understand what he meant. It's very likely that in this 12 years' time, then, that he was not only doing the thing that was traditional among Jews, namely learning their father's trade, but that he was an intense student of the Bible, the Torah, the Talmud, that everything that he could possibly lay his hands on. Otherwise, uh, the uh, New Testament would not be laced so completely with references to uh, the Old Testament. Next slide. And finally, when he's grown up, he's baptized. And here he is. And the reason I took this is this is an old Armenian miniature, possibly about the 9th or the 10th century. And it took about a thousand years before Christian art really flourished because of the taboo against the Judaic warning of uh, creating graven images. And after all, all of the early Christians were Jews, and the basic foundations of the, their beliefs were Jewish, except those new things that Christ had added, 
And so it was understandable that there should be practically nothing but symbolism in the early Christian art. And here is John the Baptist in his, in his uh, coat made of animal skin, baptizing Christ. The Marys over here are Mary Magdalene, certainly Mary, uh, his mother, certainly, and possibly one other Mary. There were six Marys altogether. And the Holy Ghost, blessing the scene, symbolized by the white dove. But up here that you can just barely see is the hand of God blessing this uh, occasion. It is a right hand. And it was one of the first basic symbols of Christianity. Even though it was taken from the Old Testament originally, it was adopted freely by those who wrote for the New Testament. It was the right hand, clasping, blessing, commanding, lofty, virile, hallowed, forceful, in contrast to the left, which is associated, which was associated with profanity and with nefarious activities. I can't help but think that most of us believe that the idea of the right wing and the left wing was conceived of as a result of the separation of the seating in the British Parliament just a few short years ago. Yet, as you can see, the use of the right hand frequently of God, I've never yet seen a painter that used the left hand, uh, epitomizes right from wrong. Next slide. Now the ministry of Jesus begins. Here he is about 30 years of age. So the first incident was calling of Peter, who's practically always shown with the white beard, and his brother Andrew. The incident was a unsuccessful fishing trip. He asked them to lower their nets again and it was filled with fish. The dolphin, incidentally, is often a symbol of Christian faith. And here's Christ on the shore saying to them, do not be afraid. From now on, it will be men that you catch. I want to show you one thing here that is very interesting. This is an old, old mosaic of the 6th century, one of the earliest of the illustrations of Christ. And in this, he was not bearded. Practically every other illustration, he will be bearded. Next slide. Another incident which was very important was the marriage at Cana, because it was the first miracle which he performed. Here is Christ. Here is his mother. This is the marriage table. And they had run out of wine. And there were six crocks of wine, by the way, and if you count them here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the artist didn't read the text too well, but at least he illustrated this miracle, which received a tremendous amount of attention by converting the water being poured into the empty wine crocks into wine so that the marriage ceremony could go on. Next slide. Here is a famous painting in Florence, Italy, in this church of San Marco by Fra Angelica, the Sermon on the Mount. When Christ here took his disciples up into the mountain and began to preach to them on the basis of their role in the ministry. This is one of the five greatest documents in the history of the world. Two of them in the Bible, the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, and three of them inspired by the Bible, the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution of the United States. There are one or two things, however, in the sermon, among the Beatitudes that have disturbed Christians for a long time, 
I might say they have disturbed me. One of them is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The socialists would have you read this as saying, Blessed are the poor. In spirit, they will inherit the kingdom of the heaven. What is really meant is that the poor in spirit are you and me, those of us who are dependent upon God and cannot exist without his spiritual guidance. The other one is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When I hear the word meek now, of course, I think of Uriah Heap. And I can't believe that Jesus had this in mind. So either the meaning of the word has been changed, or the translation was wrong. As a matter of fact, recently I ran across uh, a statement that they believe this translation from the Greek was incorrect, that the word should have been gentle. And under those circumstances, blessed are the gentle. This would epitomize and describe. The artist in this case also noticed that he puts halos on all of the disciples as well as Jesus. But here's one with a black halo. Obviously, he's trying to tell you that that was Judas. Next slide. Here's the story of the centurion with Christ uh, at this side, the centurion here, who was the mortal enemy of the Jews there. But the centurion said, my servant is ill. And Christ said, go home and you believe, and what you will believe will be done for you. And he went home and he found his servant uh, cured. This is the first instance of the conversion of a Gentile, which incidentally at that time the word was synonymous with the pagan, uh, by Christ, uh, who incidentally did very little in the way of proselyting. The proselyting was done primarily by his disciples and by Paul. Next slide. And now we're nearing the place where he is going to uh, make the supreme sacrifice. Uh, this is the scene by Caravaggio in a cathedral in Malta showing uh, John the Baptist being beheaded. The story, of course, you know, Salome, Herod's daughter, or Herodias' daughter, put on a dance, and Herod said, what can I do for you? And her mother, who was the target of John the Baptist's criticisms because of her adultery, said, give me John the Baptist's head. And here's Salome here, waiting for the head to be put into the charger. But there's one very interesting thing about this. Caravaggio is one of the few artists that makes Herodias appear as if she is remorseful and frightened as to what she had done. Next slide. The Transfiguration was a meeting high in the mountains with Peter, John, and James. And at this point, they were to see Elijah and Moses on either side in this glaring light. This was the transformation from the world, from the earthly ministry to the concentration on training his disciples as to what their mission was on earth. Next slide. And I will show you just a few more examples of the things that disturbed the Pharisees particularly. And this is a very old print from the 10th century, an English uh, Bible, uh, showing the Christ healing the blind. The illustration of this, of course, is most the, of the man that was born blind. The illustration of this is most important because it dispelled the idea that the sins of the Father would be visited upon 
their sons. Next slide. Another incident was the incident of the Good Samaritan. Both the Galileans and the Judeans despised the Samaritans. And here is a man who was pulled off from his horse. He was stripped of his clothing and of his money. A Levite came along, passed him by, and then a Samaritan came along and helped him on his horse, took him to the inn, and, and uh, uh, ministered to him. The illustration, of course, of uh, compassion and of brotherhood, which all men should have to each other. Next slide. This is Peter Bruegel's illustration of the blind leading the blind, when Luke says one man, blind man cannot lead another, and if he does, both will fall into the ditch. And here's one falling into the ditch, and here's one uh, falling into the ditch, here's one falling, and here are three or four others all on the way. Now what's this parable all about? It isn't just as simple as the blind, uh, physically blind, leading the blind. I think it's a demonstration of the mentally blind, the demonstration of the importance of individualism, the truth of the unique concept of the soul, which no one can share with you. You are your own master of your own destiny if you are to be free and independent and know how to love your brothers and know how to appreciate God. This is the antithesis of socialism. Blindness, mental blindness of the state has already led 13 previous civilizations to fall into the ditch. How long we're going to stay out of the ditch, I don't know. But at least Christ told us about it 2,000 years ago. Next. Another incident which incensed the priests was the raising of Lazarus. And here he is coming out of his grave. Here is his sister uh, Martha who called uh, Jesus after he had been interned for four days. And here are the uh, priests uh, watching the scene. They were very skeptical of this, of course. So they heard about it and they heard to see it. And I think the artist here shows something that you might observe yourself, that when you are talking to somebody, trying to convince them of your viewpoint, and they fold their arms like this, like so, you're generally wasting your time. They are totally resistant. And this is the attitude here. Next slide. Another instance of his teaching was Christ and the adulteress. They brought an adulteress before him who was obviously guilty. Now he had been preaching forgiveness of sin. And so if he said, forgive her, her sins, in the eyes of the Jewish law, he would have been guilty of blaspheme. If he had said, she is guilty, uh, and then if uh, he had said forgiveness and said, leave her go, he would have admitted his blasphemy and then he would be a heretic. But if he said stone her to death, then his preachments would have been a bald lie. So how did he handle this? No matter which way he answered, he was bound to be in trouble with the authorities. So he said, if there is one of you who has not sinned, let him cast the first stone. And they all dispersed. And he said to the woman, go and sin no more. Next slide. And then the cleansing of the temple, which is a very, uh, uh, on the, he did this twice, by the way, and this is the second uh, cleansing of the temple, and here he's raising the uh, cat of nine tails. He's chasing the money changers out with the, ad with the admonition that my house is a house of prayer, and you use it into a hideout 
for thieves. Next slide. And now we're entering the week of the Passion, the week of suffering. And this is a 6th century Byzantine our mosaic illustration of the Last Supper. Here's Christ, here's a flat table. They're all sitting around it on pillows, which incidentally was the method of eating at that time. Uh, next slide. But the famous one, of course, is the Da Vinci painting. And it deteriorated badly in the first two or three years because it was a fresco and the wall was damp, so its present uh, preservation is not much bit different than the uh, foggy uh, picture that you see here today. But what happened at the Last Supper was very important and very prophetic. First, there was a washing of the feet, which is not shown in da Vinci's uh, picture. Second, there is the breaking of the bread, which is the covenant that my body is broken, and you will accept this as a covenant. There is a prediction that there will be a pouring out of blood, and so the wine was used symbolic of this. There was the announcement for the first time that one of you will betray me. He had previously said that he would be betrayed but he had never told them that one of the disciples would betray him. So the consternation that you see here, each talking to the other, is in, is in response, I'm sure, in Leonardo's mind to the announcement of the betrayal. In addition to that, he said, all of you will lose faith. And you recall that the disciples denied up and down that they would never lose faith and give their lives if necessary. Peter was the most adamant in his denial. But Jesus reminded him, reminded all the rest of the disciples that they were a uh, human origin, that their will was frail. And he told Peter that before the cock crows, thou wilt have denied me thrice. Next. And so he went into the garden to pray. And here it shows again his duality. Here he is now again the son of man. Because he said, must I take the cup? He was apprehensive. He was fearful. He was afraid, and he needed to be told that this was his mission. One of the interesting things is that his disciples, Peter, John, and James, were with him at this time. He warned them to stay awake, but they all went to sleep. I think it's interesting that Luke, among the gospel writers, excused them because he said they all went to sleep because their grief was so great. Next slide. And this is Peter Doubt's, Doubt's illustration of the kiss of Judas with a mob scene around. Here's Peter with his sword raised about to strike off the right ear of Malchus, a servant, and when Christ reprimanded him and told him, that those who raised the sword were dying by the sword. The kiss, which has become an indelible part of uh, deceit and betrayal, unfortunately, was a usual greeting. And the kiss itself had no other significance than that of identification. Even though Judas had accepted the 30 pieces of silver to identify Christ. Again, I want to ask you in your mind, did Judas accept this bribe to identify his leader, with whom he had been almost from the beginning, for the purpose of 30 pieces of silver, which even at that time was a pittance? We'll talk about that in just a moment. Next slide. And then the 
betrayal of, or the uh, denial of Peter. And here is the little servant girl that's pointing at Peter and said, this was the man that was with the Nazarene. And he denied it and said, woman, I know him not. And again, an illustration of the fact that we are all frail. We are all human, even Christ's disciples illustrated our weaknesses. Next slide. And now he's brought before Caiaphas. Here is a bas relief, which I took recently in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, artist unknown. Caiaphas is over here. Here's Christ being brought before him. And after a, what is by most authorities uh, a judge to be an illegal trial before the Sanhedrin, it was at night, which it should never have been, there were no reliable witnesses, there was no defense. Uh, Caiaphas said, are you the Christ? And Jesus said, I am. And Caiaphas said, you are then guilty of blasphemy. He must die. He deserves to die. This is only the fourth time in our whole four Gospels that Christ ever said that he was the Son of God. Next slide. And then he's brought before uh, Pilate. And Pilate quizzed him and said, I find no fault in this man. He is not the king of the Jews that you say he is. So he tried to shrug his responsibility uh, and shifted to Herod. And so he sent him to Herod. And Herod, too, didn't want anything to do with it and sent him back after he, by mockery, put on a purple robe of, uh, of uh, usually used to signify a king. Next slide. And then Pilate decided that maybe he would placate the Jews who were demanding his death by having him scourged. And so he was beaten with a cat of nine tails here, a, um, a, a beautiful picture by Signorelli in uh, Milan, Italy. Next slide. And most of the artists will not show the effects of this flagellation, but this is by Morillo here, right here in the Boston Museum of art showing and the hemorrhages in the skin as a result of the flagellation. Next slide. But he again was not, the mob again was not satisfied. And so the soldiers having put on a crown of thorns, put on the mantle, symbolic of kingship, bound his hands, and uh, Pilate brings them before the mob and said, Eki homo. Here stands the man. He's not a king. He's not a god. He's not guilty of sedition that you say he is. He didn't say the tribute must not be paid to Caesar. And so far, here is the man. And they yelled, crucify him. And so Pilate washed his hands. Next slide. He washed his hands, as you can see here, which incidentally was certainly not a pagan ceremony. This was the cleansing act of the Judaic uh, ceremony. And said, the blood be on your hands. And unfortunately, the Bible records the fact that his be on our hands and those of our children. Judas, at this moment, saw how wrong he was went to the temple, flung down the 30 pieces of silver, rushed out, and hung himself. Is this the mark of a man who was basically subject to bribery and basically a traitor? I'll let you answer that yourself. Next slide. On the way to Golgotha then, Golgotha means, in Greek, the skull. Uh, Calvary, in Latin, the skull. 
and the hill to which he was taken had a skull shape, hence the name. And here he is bearing the heavy cross, and Simon the Serene was forced to help him carry this. And incidentally for you back there, I took this at Bob Jones University just recently, uh, when I was a guest at uh, Dr. Parker's home, and I got many beautiful religious pictures from their marvelous museum at Bob uh, Jones. Next slide. And the crucifixion. I shan't spend much time on the technical aspects of the crucifixion because it would take uh, too long. But we don't know whether it was a T cross or whether it was a uh, X cross or what kind of a cross it was. We're not even sure that nails were used. We don't know whether it was three nails or four nails. We do know that occasionally a platform was built on which the victim could be supported. And this would allow him to live, not just a few hours, but as much as 48 or even 72 hours in constant agony. It's very likely that Christ did not have a platform because he died within uh, six hours. Uh, Mary was there, John was there, but there were many other people there, of course, including uh, the soldier. Next slide. And this is another illustration by, um, by Mantega, which I took in the Louvre in Paris, showing the three crosses, Christ as the central figure, and the two uh, thieves here. You notice that one of these thieves has a loincloth, the other does not. I'll speak of that in just a moment, because nakedness was one of the basic humiliations that went with uh, crucifixion. Most of the artists, of course, were put a, a loincloth on Christ. Next slide. And now let's discuss for a moment the seven last words. This is Christ ascending the cross in an old Psalter of the 13th century. And he looks down at the people who are engaged in his crucifixion and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why did he say this? Why was he interested in having Father forgive them? This was the basis of his ministry, the forgiveness of sin. And even at the highest point, of activity on the part of his mortal enemies to destroy him, he called upon our forgiveness of sins. So his principles and his teachings were carried right through to the end. Next slide. The next word was, Woman, behold thy son. And here is Jesus looking down at his mother Mary, and John standing next to her. This is Mary Magdalene, by the way. And incidentally, I'm imagining this. I've picked these out of many, many pictures of crucifixions which I have, thinking that the artist might have had this in mind. I have no way of knowing whether the artist really had this in mind. But it looks as though he might have had it in mind. And Jesus when he said, Woman, behold thy son, remembered the divinity of the Jewish family unit as part, an important part of Jewish tradition. It comes from the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy son. And therefore he didn't want to leave a vacuum in the family. And since John was the one that he loved, he asked John to join the family. Five. Next slide. And the third word was, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Here's another instance in which one of the things is covered by a loincloth and the other is naked. You remember they were taunting him for not getting off the cross? If you are the king of the Jews, if you are the Christ, why don't you descend from the cross? And the repentant thief said to the unrepentant thief, he said, he has not sinned. We deserve this. 
So Christ said to the repentant thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He announced, therefore, not only his forgiveness, but he announced to the world that salvation was not a myth. Next slide. And here's one I took in a church in Mexico City. Christ looking upward, his eyes anxious, his mouth open. I think it fits the words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This has caused many Christians great concern. It certainly has caused me great concern. Did Jesus really believe that he was abandoned? Or was he, as some theologians believe, reciting the beginning of the 22nd Psalm, which starts, my God, my God? Did he lose faith? Or was he expressing the same kind of agony and apprehension that he did as the Son of Man in the Garden of Gethsemane? In some of the original translations, instead of saying, my God, the translations say, Eli, Eli, E-L-I, E-L-I, which in Hebrew means Papa, Papa. And this is then the Son of Man speaking. And he had to suffer because in order to carry out his mission, this was part of the way. He had to behave. He had to feel exactly as man would have felt. Next slide. And this is a Goya uh, in which his mouth is open, he's looking straight ahead, and I can imagine his lips are parched, and he said, I thirst. This seems a rather strange thing for a divine person to be uh, thinking about thirst. But again, it shows it humanness and certainly doesn't demonstrate the other part of his dual character, the divine part. Next, Benny. And here is a, a rather gruesome appearing crucifixion by Grunewald, which is in the National Gallery in Washington. He shows a very graphic appearance of his beat up, uh, flagellated body uh, with Mary here and, and John here and his head almost down, and he says, it is finished. Did he mean by this that he was going to die? Or was this an announcement that his earthly work was finished? And I think it was the latter. Next. And finally, one of the most beautiful of all other crucifixions that I have ever seen is Velasquez in the Prado Museum in Madrid. Here he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Here he loses his duality. He sheds his role as the son of man and becomes the son of God. It's probably from the 31st Psalm and the 5th verse, which says, Into thine hands I commit my spirit, thou who has redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. This beautiful painting, I think, illustrates the oneness of the individual, the uniqueness of the soul, the serenity of faith, and the tranquility of salvation. Next slide. And here he's taken down from the cross, and this is one by van der Weyden here, and incidentally, here's his friend, a rich man by the Joseph, by Joseph of Arimathea, who not only helps him down from the cross, but gives him his tomb. Next slide. And here he is being taken into the tomb by his friend Nicodemus and Joseph. Friends, next slide. And here he is uh, in, uh, as a, uh, in a state of resurrection, coming out of the tomb, and I selected this one because it's a very, very old one. And it illustrates real well the fact that the guards, according to the Bible, were described as if they, had, they were dead men. And you can see them lying here as if they were sound asleep or in a coma. 
And here is Christ coming out of the tomb. Next slide. And here is the risen Christ seen for the first time by Mary Magdalene. And he says, touch me not, nor me tangere, because I go to find my brothers, and I have not yet ascended into the house of my father. Next slide. And here is the first instance in which he sees uh, three of his disciples at the supper at Emmaus. And next slide. And finally, after he had seen uh, many of his disciples, incidentally, he saw his disciples on ten different occasions. He saw Thomas, and Thomas would not uh, believe. And so he said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Then stretch out your hand and put it into my side where the soldiers had put the sword. And when he did this, Thomas said, I believe. And Christ said, quit your doubting. May I have the lights, please, now? So this is the termination of my little discussion. I hope as a uh, layman that you realize that I am by no means a authority in the field of theology, but that my heart is uh, clearly uh, devoted to the teachings of our faith, and that this little recitation will have reviewed, renewed, at least in the minds of some of you, uh, our faith in which we believe. God, our country, and our family. Thank you very much. Dr. Sheikin has done his homework exceptionally well, and everyone else who has knows that the reason we are in such a terrible shape in our country today is that we are really in a deadly fight between the godly and the anti-god, <clears throat> or the Christly and the antichrist. And we know, too, that what Dr. Schenken is presenting is further evidence that the miracles are not myths, that the, where the poo-poo, the virgin birth, that type thing as expanded by the National Council of Churches. We know this is wrong.